Hi, I'm Femi O.K. And I'm Malika Bilal. How do you build peace? The Dalai Lama says young people are the root of the solution. But what does that actually mean? We will ask the Tibetan spiritual leader personally today on the stream. My name is Patrick Hermanson. I'm a researcher at Hope Not Hate, and I'm in the stream. The United Nations estimates that 600 million young people, that's half of the world's youth population, live in areas affected by conflict. But despite the challenges of growing up in turmoil, many young people are striving to make a difference. In fact, a group of young peace builders from around the world have converged on the Dalai Lama's compound in India to learn from each other and the spiritual leader himself. The event, organized by the United States Institute of Peace, seeks to give them the practical skills and the personal resilience needed to work in their home countries. So how do you build peace in times of conflict? Joining us to talk about this, we have the Dalai Lama and two youth leaders participating in the U.S. Institute of Peace event, Aluel Manyok from South Sudan and Paolo Porras from Colombia. Welcome, everybody. Dalai Lama, it is such a pleasure to have you on the stream. I have been looking at a picture of you as a very young boy. You are about four years old in a monastery in eastern Tibet. As a child, as a youngster, what was the most valuable lesson you learned about building peace? I was a very, very lazy student. <laughs> <laughs> but now, gradually, I realize these things which I study is really immense help to keep my mind fresh. Sharp, because uh, we study uh, the how to analyze things. You see, at the beginning, we should keep more skeptical, skepticism, not just believe easily, then analyze, analyze. Paula and Aluel, I was just looking at your group from a picture that you took a day ago. And there you are, surrounded by the Dalai Lama, and everybody is smiling, and he is mentoring you. What is he like as a mentor? Um, oh, what is it like as a mentor? Um, it was quite an experience for me yesterday. I felt like I wasn't only um, spiritually empowered, but there's, there's just something about the energy in this room that really, really gave me the peace of mind that I needed. And when I asked uh, my question, at least I had the chance to ask His Holiness my question yesterday, and he really answered me in details. And I've just, I've just been going through that response in my head, and I feel like all the solutions I needed are in that package he gave me yesterday, and it's just up to me to bring it or to decide the stages I need to unlock the, the answer he gave me yesterday. So it was really a good start for me personally uh, yesterday. And I'm looking forward to today's conversation. I think it's even going to be more than what we had yesterday. Yeah, and uh, for me, uh, first of all, he's really funny. So it makes it like really easy. And um, he, uh, when you talk about the Dalai Lama, he is just um, like he, uh, you, you visualize him like here. And when you talk actually with him, you see him as a person. He makes yeah. it so easy and so practical. Like uh, it's not um, when he speaks, it's not like you think that peace is not achievable. That you can actually do it. And all of the things, even if he, he spoke also like from all uh, religions, ethnicities, ways of thinking, not only for their belief, uh, his belief. So I think that's an amazing thing for um, for having him as a mentor. <laughs> So we got this comment here uh, from Bree on Twitter, and she wants to know what the U.S. can learn from youth peace leaders and peacemakers around the globe, especially as our country, she says, speaking of the U.S., becomes more divided and mass violence increases. She's directing this to the Dalai Lama. What do you make of what the U.S. and young leaders here can learn from those who are in that room with you and from your own background? As far as you say, my impression is uh, sometimes leaders, you see, they uh, consider 
uh, they live a different level of sort of world. The real, I think, representative of human being, I think, these innocent people, and particularly people who come from really difficult area. So they really believe this uh, harmony is very important. So therefore, I think, I hope the leaders, including spiritual leaders, I think worthwhile to listen more from these young people whose life really passing through difficult sort of uh, experience. So that's my feeling. So these young people, youth, who passing through immense difficulties, including danger of their own life, uh, but still keep hope, optimism, determination. That's really wonderful. So there is real opportunity if we keep that sort of self-confidence and willpower with human intelligence and human warm-heartedness, we can change our world, a uh, more better world, more compassionate world. That's my absolute conviction. So therefore, uh, in spite old person, now physically, sometimes difficult, but I determined you see, to serve these young people. Uh, these are future of the humanity, future of the world. I don't want you to tease us just a little bit about the Dalai Lama told you something that actually you're still percolating in your mind right now. This is the moment when you ask the question right here on the laptop. I'm just going to look one more here where you asked him about your passion, what you're working on in South Sudan. What was it that the Dalai Lama told you that will help you be a better peacemaker, peace builder? Uh, my question was on education and women empowerment, and his response was, we, I might, we might not see the impact of what we're doing now, but if we invest in education and patience, all these obstacles will be eradicated with time. So me, when he gave me that package of invest in education and women must take lead in peace building and then patience, it just completely made sense because you cannot educate someone today and they graduate tomorrow and they're able to give back, uh, back to the community. It's a process. And I just felt like maybe this is an initial start and it's a long-term impact, but it's going to be for a better good tomorrow. Mm. Well, one way to make it a better good is uh, uh, referenced here in this tweet from Jim, and he says it might be involving women. So Jim says, comment on the place of women in the peace landscape. Are they a latent resource in this realm? And Paula, I'm going to give that one to you. Do you ever feel that you have to prove yourself when you're in these discussions and you're in these rooms and these spaces as a, a female leader and a youth leader at that? Do you feel that you have to go a little bit step a step further than other people have to? Yeah, I think I, I felt um, uh, like <clears throat> that uh, when, for example, if you are in a conference room with someone and uh, you're speaking, uh, you're with a man, uh, like they always look uh, to the man. They, they don't look at the woman. And you start feeling like, why, why you start questioning yourself? Like, why do, doesn't they look at me? I mean, I'm here at the room. And even if you speak, um, they, they just don't hear you. And, um, and yeah, that happens to me many, many times. And, but I think it's like we have the power to change that. Actually, we have to empower ourselves and speak more, like not loudly, like more powerful maybe, so they can hear us. So yeah, uh, there's been um, this culture of um, misogyn misogynist uh, culture. Um, I think it's all around the world, but also it's spread uh, in Latin America, in Colombia, in my country. And um, it's really hard sometimes to get to believe you. But with your actions, you get it. It's, it's take more steps, but you actually get it. 
Your holiness, I have a feeling, I have a theory that part of your power, part of your spirituality is in your hand. Let me tell you why I have that theory. Because when I watch you sit and talk with people, you always reach out and touch them. So this is you yesterday with the group, talking to them. And again, touching, touching the face, touching the cheek. And then this picture, back in 2015, it is with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. You're talking about joy. And again, that right hand, that arm reaching out and touch. Why is that so important to what you do, how you connect with people? Firstly, I think the best way to communicate or showing your real feeling is smile. In order to do that, a formality, I don't like formality. <laughs> uh, at all, when we born, no formality. When we die, no formality. Uh, formality is artificial. It actually becomes some additional barrier. So we should talk, human being to human being. So then, uh, automatically come sort of closeness feeling. And with that, love and teasing. And then touch. Mm -hmm. So then, particularly, I, I, I had become quite cold then, remember like that. <laughs> I, 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 I got some benefit. <laughs> then also, you see, uh, uh, it is good to touch other's face, and I can, uh, I can test the softness. <laughs> There's some people that say touch might not be enough. This is Ahmed out of Nigeria, and this is what he told the stream. Because of my advocacy for nonviolence, the Nigerian army declared me wanted. There should be a way to resolve issues in a nonviolent manner, but the government did later apologize. That's given me the moral ground to work even more. Another person picking up on that being viewed as a threat. This is being Charlie who writes, many years later, China still views the Dalai Lama as a foe. How does he intend to change that? That's for me personally. That is. Uh, nothing serious. Nothing serious. So when, uh, uh, some time back, See, sometimes you see some Chinese officials describe me as a uh, demon. So on occasion, some reporter asked me, uh, some Chinese official describe you as a demon. What is your reaction? Then I reacted, oh, yes, I'm a demon. <laughs> <laughs> then sometimes I jokingly say, telling, my home seems longer, longer, longer. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, uh, we respect Chinese people, Histori so historical people, cultured people, hardworking. Now today, uh, as a matter of fact, most of the populated nation, and over 2,000 years, China, Tibet, very close link. Uh, through marriage, like that. Uh, I'm monk, no possibility of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and then, we are not seeking independence. We are not seeking separation. In spite of past history. See, we always look to this reality. And I'm one of the person who really admire the spirit of European Union. So you see China, I said, we are very much want, uh, committed, <coughs> remain within the people's world with China. And provided they should give us uh, this certain right with, which mentioned in Chinese constitution, these should implement fully on, 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 the, on the spot. So we usually call middle of approach, not seeking separation but not satisfy the existing sort of policy or situation like that. 
So I wanted to share with you uh, one of the most asked questions from our community. We got several messages about this, people wanting to ask you this question. This is one, Nader Hassan. What does the Dalai Lama have to say about the Rohingya? Another person, Ali Zaki, says, quick question. As a Buddhist that preaches peace, what's the Dalai Lama's take on the Rohingya massacre, as he puts it, and should the culprits be held accountable? What is your take? on the situation in, in, in uh, Myanmar? Very, very sad. Very sad. When I first know, you see, that incidents, uh, I express all these, you see, the, uh, including Burmese army, they should visualize Buddha's face. The Buddha there, he 100% sure he take uh, help I mean, he, 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 he will help to those suffering people, irrespective of what they are believe, what they are religion. But then, you see, at that time, uh, uh, Times Magazine, you see, or cover one Buddhist monk and described as a Buddhist terrorist. I felt it's totally wrong. And then also, uh, now these uh, years, I particularly was telling the wording Muslim terrorist, it's wrong. Some my friend, Muslim friend, practitioner of Islam, they told me a person who claimed themselves as a follower of Islam, if create bloodshed, no longer genuine practice, genuine follower of Islam. So the genuine Islam practitioner should extend love towards entire uh, creature of Allah. Wonderful. So therefore, the wording Buddhist terrorist and Muslim terrorist seems to say Muslim as well as terrorist as well as Buddhism, terrorist, is totally wrong. Yeah. As soon as committed some sort of uh, violence or terrorist work, no longer Islam or Muslim or Buddhist. So that's, I think, very important. We too much, sometimes we too much generalize, not precise. So European Union, I think two, two years ago, maybe two years ago, I have been European Union. I also mentioned that. This wording that is totally wrong. Your Holiness, you met Aung San Suu Kyi, who is a fellow Nobel laureate, in 2013. This picture is with you, with her, in Prague, in the Czech Republic. You're very close. You look very close here. What would you advise her about bringing peace with her Rohingya community in Myanmar? How would you use I your skills? Uh, at that meeting, I mentioned to her, uh, as a Nobel laureate sister, should speak, should do something. And then she told me, very complicated situation. So I think the World Organization, including United Nations, now speaking on behalf of these people, suffering people, it is really encouraging. And many uh, human, as a day, as a day, human rights organization. And then also I really uh, admire and appreciate many organizations really helping people who are facing starvation. Wonderful, really wonderful. So the, when I saw these things, how I really feel, oh, still in this complicated world, still uh, compassion carries some work. So these are the, I consider, seed. One seed we properly care, then can grow like that. So these really uh, human-created problems. No one else we can blame. 
all problem we created. So logically, we human being have the ability to reduce or to eliminate these problem which essentially human being created. And logically also we have the moral responsibility to reduce these man-made problems. Like that. Paula, you use social media as a platform to help teach young people, to give them tools, to stop conflict in their neighborhood, particularly in Colombia and also in Latin America. There's a picture here of you with youngsters who are reclaiming what was a violent public space. The Dalai Lama has been saying how much he gets from young people. What are you teaching His Holiness over the next couple of days? What can you teach him? What can I teach him? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Okay, that's a tough one. So, no, I'm actually, I, I mean, like young people, um, we all here have the power of technology. That's why I use technology. I think <coughs> we are, uh, uh, like, everybody's saying that young people have, like, many, um, like, the power, have the power to change things, but it's not because we are more smart or we have other abilities. It's just because I think we have technology. And with technology and with social media also, we can spread the word more easily to the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think... Um, I think uh, that's why I use also uh, like a virtual platform because uh, I used to just uh, with Somos Capaces, my, like my organization, we uh, were able just to be in Bogota. And now with this uh, using of technology, we are being able to be in 46 countries of our city. Seven of them, uh, they are prioritized by the post-conflict. They don't even have like water. They're being, uh, it's so difficult to get there uh, by plane, by car. So with technology, we can do this. Um, I have a question for uh, actually the, the, his, uh, your holiness is that there is an intergenerational gap between uh, young people and also uh, grown people. Um, there's been like young people are taking action and so many times even if it's true uh, we complain about how we are being um, like uh, grown people don't listen to us. Uh, but I think it's more, we don't have, uh, we, uh, even if it's true, uh, we don't need to complain, but maybe if you can um, have any uh, thought about how we can approach grown people so they can listen to us, because I think this is not a matter of complaining, like they don't, why don't, don't you hear me, but just how can we approach them to hear us also and to work together? Suddenly. Sometimes, you see, uh, people in good Tibetan, sometimes you see older people, looks younger people, they innocent, not much experience. Uh, uh, but I feel, I notice, sometimes the old people, they still, is their way of thinking is the, let's say, the 20th century's way of thinking. Uh, now the reality much changed. So now we have to act according new reality. So in that respect, you see the younger generation, you see who live now in 21st century, uh, and as you mentioned, you see through technology these things, you see younger people seem to see better knowledge, knowledgeable uh, things. Uh, so therefore, their mind more fresh. Sometimes, I think due to lack of experience, sometimes more sort of what's the, uh, what's the impatience. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I think young people now they are their thinking is more realistic. So older people should listen more. And suddenly, you see, elder people have more experience share the young people, but the new ideas, I think, usually come from younger generation. I feel like that. I can't Thank think you. of a better place to end. Thank you so much, Your Holiness Dalai Lama, Alawa Manyok, Paola Porus, the United States Institute of Peace. Thank you all for being part of this program today. We will see you online. Take care, everybody.